Hey guys, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to get started here real quick. I just wanted to, uh, we're just trying to get it so that the lightning talks go on both uh, projectors. So um, first thing I want to say is thank you guys all for coming. Um, this has really been a great first day and we have a full day tomorrow. Uh, kicked off by Lars uh, and his amazingness. Um, no one put their names on the lightning talks. So all I have is titles. So Does that mean we can pick one we like? That, that's exactly what I'm thinking. So whoever wants to claim these talks, I'm gonna, uh, you're going to be named by the talk. Um, so the first two up, OK, so here's how it works. Um, lightning talks are five-minute talks, and you will get booted off the stage at five minutes. I will be having a laptop right here that you can look at with the time. At zero, 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 I will start clapping, and everyone else has to start clapping, OK? <laughs> that means they get off the stage. Uh, I don't want to have to bring out the taser or anything like that. All right, so um, these lightning talks, anyone can give. And um, the way I'm going to say it is I'm going to say who's on deck. And that is, is that, does that, who, who knows baseball? On deck, does that mean the person that's talking or the person that's not talking? <laughs> Max, OK. So who's the person that's actually talking? The, uh, at bat, OK. So at bat, <laughs> it's going to be the, the, and then there's the on deck. When I call on deck, whoever wants to claim that talk goes over there and gets their laptop set up. And then you'll come over here, and you'll have about 30 seconds to get a video feed up. If you don't get a video feed up, you'll be booted and put back in the line, OK? And um, if we do happen to run out of time, we're going to try and stop at 7, as close to 7 as possible. If you're one of the later talks, um, you will be first tomorrow. If you can't give it tomorrow, let me know, and we'll make an exception. Um, but we want to make sure you guys Get out of here as close to 7 as possible, uh, because I know you're hungry, I'm hungry, and we want to eat. So, All right, so the first talk, and the guy that started the trend of not putting their names on the lightning talks, <laughs> uh, Jason Meyer's SQL Alchemy Automap, and on deck is Gratipay 2.0, formerly GitTip. And then in the hole, is using scikit-learn for reservoir analysis. And oh, Seth King, he actually did put his name. So there are a couple of names. So Seth King, you're in the house. All right, thank you, Seth. Um, all right, all right hit the button. All right, so I'm going to waste some of my time explaining that uh, I was recently playing with something, which is how I found this. And then it was so utterly simple, I was just amazed and had to share. Um, so this is a test database that exists out in the world. It's called the Chinook database. Uh, and it's got a bunch of random album stuff in it. But I work in a job where I occasionally get data that I have no idea what's in that file, like it's some random database dump that no one kept the model definitions for, and so enjoy. Uh, and so there's this great thing in SQL Alchemy that I recently found. Now, there's always been reflection in SQL Alchemy in the core side of SQL Alchemy, but if you wanted to do ORM things, you had to like manually build those models. Well, I found this thing recently that was added, uh, I think, in 09, in the 0 0.9 release called AutoMap. So what I'm going to do is import AutoMap from the SQL Alchemy extension of AutoMap and then create myself an ORM session. Uh, and then instead of using the normal declarative base that I would use uh, for SQL Alchemy ORM, I'm using the AutoMap base. And what that actually does is it's going to create me uh, essentially something like a metadata container that it will then like reflect all of that data into that metadata container and then create ORM usable classes. Like, I don't even, there's magic there that I'm sure is amazing that I could never understand, but I've done it and it works. And it works ridiculously well, which this is the greatest demo ever, right? See the numbers on the right hand side? No, I'm just kidding. So it actually went through that and created classes. Those are ORM classes that I can query just like any other SQL Alchemy class, uh, just from those few lines of code. So again, all I did was create a class, connect it to an engine, and say, hey, prepare all that data that's in that engine for use as an ORM class. That's what the number three right there does. So number four is just a list of all the classes that it created for me. And just to prove that they're actual like things I can play with, I'm going to map a couple of those classes that are in there out to simpler aliases, open up a session, 
and then run queries against that data. Right? So here happen to be the first 10 uh, artists and IDs that are in that, uh, in that database. And then to go a step further, I can actually, it created relationships. Right? So it went in, reflected the models, cool, realized that there were foreign key relationships, tried to analyze whether they were one-to-many, many-to-one, blah, 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 whatever, and it figured it out, like probably faster than I could, and actually let me query artists, then go get the artist's album collection and print the name and the, art and the album. The end. Half of a lightning talk, enjoy. All right, at bat, Gratipay 2.0, formerly Git tip. Um, on deck, using scikit-learn for reservoir analysis, Seth King. And in the hole, Lunchbox, social media image generator tool, Joseph Masby. OK, am I on? All right. So I get two extra minutes. Wait. All right. <laughs> My name's Chad. I'm down here from Pittsburgh. Uh, hi. Uh, three years ago, I gave a lightning talk about a project that I just launched a month earlier called Git Tip. And I think some of you here were here for that lightning talk. Git Tip was a tip jar for GitHub, a way to give money to uh, open source programmers that make awesome libraries for the rest of us. And then two years ago, uh, I got up and gave a lightning talk about GitIp, which was the new pronunciation of GitTip, because we were trying, trying to broaden beyond just geeks and programmers to so getting away from just GitTip, um, GitIp. Last year, um, the, name of this, the name of this lightning talk I'm giving now is um, Chad Learns About Law. <laughs> so uh, a, a year, a, last year, I uh, started hearing some back-channel rumblings from uh, Software Freedom Conservancy, who manages the Git trademark. <laughs> and uh, last year, long story short, we ended up renaming the whole thing to Gratipay. So Gratitude, Gratipay. So that's our current name, Gratipay. So that was last year. Then, uh, you know, and that, that, that was a brush with some law. Then uh, three months ago, we actually went out of business. Gratipay went out of business. And uh, the name of the blog post uh, where we announced to the world that we went out of business was Gratapocalypse. <laughs> so the Gratapocalypse was uh, today, I think it was 86 days ago today. And we uh, worked our, uh, and we went out of business because uh, our payment processor, Balanced Payments, some of you may know about balanced payments. They're going out of business. And when they announced they were going out of business, they sent all their customers to Stripe. Uh, how many have heard of balanced payments? OK, how many have heard of Stripe? Yeah, right, OK. So they sent everyone to Stripe. So we went to Stripe, and Stripe was like, you know, we're actually not going to accept you as a customer because um, we think that your, <laughs> your business model qualifies as money transmission. We're an open source project, so I started like researching online and had a GitHub ticket that was like, find out what money transmission means, right? <laughs> Chad learns about law. So uh, turns out that there were some real concerns. I think my lawyer will be OK with me telling you publicly on a video uh, that's going to go on the web that there were some legal concerns uh, that we had that, that Stripe made us aware of and that uh, we decided were significant enough uh, that we went out of business <laughs> and um, came back as Gratipay 2.0. So what this means, and the reason that I'm up here in front of you, is that this is, this is kind of a public service announcement because uh, those of you who uh, were here three years, three years ago and used GitTip, were here two years, two years ago and used GitIp, or were using Gratipay, there's like several thousand of you, and I have $150,000 of your money that came in under our old terms of service that I need to get out of the system back to you, <laughs> okay? Um, so we actually have this process underway uh, where we're kind of migrating. Yes, yeah, so we've, we've got Gratipay 1.0 is behind us, Gratipay 2.0 is the future. I have $150,000 of your money, and I would love your help to give that back to you, um, or we're going to refund it back to the people it originally came from. Uh, before Balanced Payments turns off their refund API on October 9th. Uh, <laughs> anyway, long, long story short, um, 
I'm going to probably set up an open space tomorrow. Uh, so any of you that are Gratapay users, I'm sure you know many of you, most of you are not. Uh, but it, any of you who are Gratapay users and have any questions about all the stuff that's been going on and uh, you know how to get that 150,000, how to get your portion of that, how to get your money out of it, um, yeah. Or if you just want to try and get that 150,000 from me, just show up tomorrow. Uh, look, check the open source. Um, Check the, uh, what is the open space board tomorrow and uh, look for Gratapay on there. Uh, I'll be in a room uh, talk about that, answering any questions. So, yeah, all right. Thank you. All right, on base is using scikit-learn for reservoir analysis. Um, on deck is Lunchbox social media image generator tool, Joseph Masby. And in the hole is open source memes. Bro, yeah. All right. Um, so I'm Seth King. I am a site support contractor at the National Energy Technology Laboratory and um, I had a student intern this summer, so like a good mentor, I am taking credit for their work. Her name was uh, Molly Nichols. Um, so at the National Energy Technology Laboratory, we are interested in what's called carbon sequestration, the process of injecting CO2 into the ground and leaving it there. And the problem with that is making sure that it doesn't go somewhere we didn't want it to go, like into the groundwater or back into the atmosphere. Um, this is a really complicated system to model. We, we want to see if it will move around, and we want to assess the risks of um, that CO2 migrating. We, we can do physics-based simulations of this model, but to do that, we have to know all of the parameters of this system, like rock properties of porosity and permeability, and we don't really know what's going on thousands of feet in the ground. We can uh, get pr ideas of that. We can put bounds on those, um, but we can't put exact values. They vary in space. So we're going to model this with a Monte Carlo process. That means running thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different models, so we need it to run very quickly. And our physics-based models won't run quick enough. That would take millions of years. So we want to take uh, several physics-based simulations, train a regression function. We're going to use scikit-learn uh, to train a regression function. That regression function will run really quickly. Here, this is the kind of data that we're trying to match. The top graph is a saturation profile. That's where the CO2 is. And the bottom graph is the pressure profile in the, the reservoir. This is one time slice. There's usually like 40 time slices. It's 100 by 100 grid. It, we end up with like a million data points for each realization. There's a lot of data. It takes a lot of time to do stuff. Here. I've trained a Gaussian process model with scikit-learn. We have a lot of options for what our actual regression function is. There's some properties of Gaussian process that we hope to use in the future. We're not right now. Um, but you can see our, our actual data versus our predicted data for one validation set. Um, we use a leave one out validation and do an iteration on that because we tend to have only about 50 to 100 uh, actual simulations to train against. And here's some of the metrics that we're coming up with to see if our fit is any good at all. Um, on the top, we have actual versus predicted. The best fit would be on that y equals x line. You can see saturation doesn't quite fit as well as pressure does. And we found this really interesting uh, thing that happens is our R squared values of those plots go down over time. I don't know why that is. We have more validation to do there. 
Um, so what can we do with this? Uh, this isn't using the whole systems model, but for this reservoir, it had three parameters that we varied of porosity and permeability and a permeability of the, the rock above it. We ran it many times to see if it would work. We got good output of that. We, we did a, an analysis that we do on the, the discrete realizations that where we get just one plume size saying, this is where the pressure increases enough that we need to monitor it and worry about it. And now with this Monte Carlo process, we can talk about that as a probability. So that means the probability in this area that the pressure will be above that range and needs to be monitored. And that's not as intuitive to think about. It's a more Bayesian way of thinking about things, but it's more honest because we, we don't really know exactly what's going on in that space. Um, and then just some contact info. The DOE didn't actually pay me to come. So personal info and a little bit about the project. All right, up next is Lunchbox. Uh, on deck is open source memes, and after that, teaching Python as an information activity. Is that working? Awesome. All right, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Joseph Mosby. Um, I think that my O must have looked like an, like an A, but we're all good. Um, so what I'm here to talk about is a tool that I did not write called Lunchbox. Um, and it only came out on Wednesday, so I am only partially sure how it actually works. Um, so I didn't write it, and uh, I and it's only been out since Wednesday, so I've had a limited amount of time to figure out it, figure it out. But I've been so excited about it uh, that I had to share it with you guys. So I work for a news organization called National Journal, and uh, I spend about forty percent of my day trying to figure out how to get you to share things on the internet. The other forty percent of the time, I try to figure out how to get you to view ads. Um, and one of the things that is pretty much constant when we talk about uh, sharing in social media is that you are way more likely to share something if there is a photo attached. Um, and this is even true if it's a photo of text. Um, that, if, that, you are, that you can actually put, a t put text of an image and basically take a screen grab of a, of a post, and people are way more likely to actually share that. Um, because what you, know, you see a lot of people that are actually interacting on mobile, and so it allows you to kind of click and get a preview of the article that you're about to read. Um, and so you, can act, you see this with news organizations where they will, you'll basically just make a point to attach pictures to anything. Um, you don't necessarily see this if you are on your own feed, um, but if you go to any major news organization's page and just look at just their feed, almost everything has a photo attached to it. Um, so figuring out how to actually generate those um, is tough. And so NPR uh, actually re released an application that they call Lunchbox. Um, and Lunchbox is, um, Lunchbox is a way to automatically generate these things. Um, so you can, you can basically copy in a quote. Um, that you, this is one of my coworkers saying this, uh, that you can copy in a quote and basically have a branded image that gets generated um, and get in there and you can basically make some small tweaks to the theme. You can get in here and change the quote for uh, Pi Ohio and update this to my own name. And then I've, I've copied, I could have basically copy a nice little branded quote. Say I want to do it on a nice Twitter aspect ratio and immediately dump the photo out and, it, and, and live generated. This is a desktop app that's just basically live generating these quotes. You can do the same thing um, for Fact list, which is basically if you wanted to have a little uh, list of things that you can basically put up and, and kind of allows you to expand past the Twitter character limit. Um, and again, it allows you to do some the same thing, make those same tweaks, change out your theme. If you want to do something a little custom, it's automatically generating a timestamp. And again, click Save, and you're able to basically dump that image right out. Waterbug is doing the same thing, um, but with pictures. Um, so you can upload a picture or link to one on the web. Um, you, can, you can basically adjust the crop in here, change the aspect ratio that you want to work with. You can sync up with, uh, 
with some of your standard copyright holders. Um, we, we work with the Associated Press. We work with Getty a lot. Um, and it allows you to basically make a tweak here and then say it automatically will dump that, uh, dump that caption on there as a watermark. Um, so, it, I mean, really, really powerful stuff that we actually don't see a lot of in, in these tools, but NPR has made this very useful for us. But, you know, okay, this is fine. We're generating images. What is really exciting about this is the actual code that's powering it. Um, so this code is actually um, all a web app. Um, a web app is basically, it's running a little bit of Python, a little bit of Node, um, a hefty amount of less and some HTML templates. Um, but it's all easily customizable. If you've done any sort of bootstrap work, it's nothing more complex than that. Um, this is what this is what our basic template looks like um, for when you go to the main page. If you go into the quotable app, the one where you're copying and pasting your temp your quotes into the form, it's again more bootstrap that you change the template out, and um, and you're able to basically say, okay, this is what I want my little image to look like. Um, so this, the template that I was using is not the stock NPR one. I've actually modified this doing some basic HTML tweaks. Uh, you're able to go in here and make some changes on key variables. Uh, so we use uh, Roboto as our font for this. We don't use the NPR standard Helvetica. Um, able to make some tweaks for certain fonts. If we want to change our quote to look something different, change the path. All right. All right, up now is open source memes. On deck is teaching Python as an information activity. And after that, R. Lundo, undo in any interactive interpreter star that uses read line. Oops. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about memes. Uh, we use Slack at work, so naturally uh, sending memes is an essential form of communication. Uh, but most of the meme generator sites are they're either like ad-ridden or slow, or they don't even allow you to hot link to the images. So I made a meme generator. Uh, it works a little different than the other ones. You go to memegen.link, and I'm going to go slash IW for Insanity Wolf, and I'm going to type some text here. So it's top line of text, bottom line of text. Uh, so it's and it's not just an image generator; it's actually an API. It's a, using Flask and Flask API. So if you remove the extension, you can see the URL that's generated. You can also generate it uh, without with masked text. Um, but the whole server is stateless. Uh, this this in this like mass of text here just contains the entire meme image or information. Um, if we go to the the root of the API, you can look at a list of meme templates. Uh, so like Futurama Fry uh, has a name, a link to a uh, reference about that meme to read more, a list of aliases that you can use when you're typing just the name of it, uh, and then a link to example. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this uses Flask, Flask API, and Pillow to generate the images. Uh, it's on, if you go, to the home page, you can view the code on GitHub. 
all the memes are defined with just a YAML file, and there are all the new templates are added through pull requests. So if you want to add a meme, uh, send me a pull request. And if you use Slack at the bottom of the README, there's a few bots people have already created uh, that you can just launch an instance of, and it will let you type a short command to, to generate a meme. So send me a pull request and let's open source memes. <laughs> All right, up now teaching Python. Arlundo is on deck, and then open source, open science grants. <laughs> Bugs there. Can't file a pull request from WhatsApp. Uh, yeah, so um, teaching Python as an information activity. I'm a librarian, uh, data librarian in particular. Uh, I, so I think about stuff and I think about information problems. I hear you guys talk and I hear the information problems in them. Uh, we talk about Googling a problem as it's a normal activity, because it is a normal activity. Um, we know that, like, Looking up information is a vital activity. <laughs> so this talk is more of a call to action than like, hey, my project's awesome. This has to do with like my personal research. But yeah, so we know that this stuff is the nor a normal behavior of the work that we do. Why aren't we teaching it to students or mentoring people about it or publishing on it or writing about it in blogs or something? So I'm working on a model to describe how uh, at the top you have information activities, at the bottom you have coding activities. I describe the activities as equal. You can't continue on and move forward through the learning curve and past the learning curve of programming without learning, knowing how to look crap up, right? So, <laughs> and the more you learn, the better you can look stuff up. And the better you can look stuff up, the more you can learn. And oh my god, it's a loop and it's not going to ever end until you're like, no, I'm going to go work on a farm. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so the point is, start teaching this stuff. If you have a junior person or if you're in a mentor role, like, talk to them. Talk to them about how to Google things. There's an excellent article uh, that threw a whole bunch of novice self-trained programmers into a UX lab and watched them try to code. And the stuff that came out of them was amazing and terrifying. They were looking, so it was like, working in Photoshop using some JavaScript stuff. They were looking in the Photoshop documentation for help on for loops. They copied entire lines of code full of local variables into Google. I replicated a really basic problem that a lot of my students run into, and it had, to be, it had like random dot choice in it, and I replicated all local variables. The first result was for the Java documentation, so we need to talk to them about this stuff and help them get better. So like, how do we make a self-sufficient programmer? They can look stuff up and answer their own questions and not be a crazy person on Stack Overflow and get yelled at. We have an amazing community, but Stack Overflow, man. Uh, so talk to them about the books that are helpful, like the Python cookbook. Uh, chapter six, man, give me data. Uh, <laughs> the Python pocket guide. How to appropriately assess the value of Stack Overflow, how to appropriately pose a question. Uh, our Reddit communities are awesome, so hands together for everyone on Reddit who isn't a jerk, because you're probably in Python, or ask or learn Python. Uh, Pi Video, also shout out to whoever, people who run Pi Video, it's, it's amazing, I show it to all of my students. Um, so also walk through newbies, looking at a semantic bug, like, and how do you look at these 10 lines of codes, and uh, 10 lines of code, and know like, oh, these 10 characters are the things that you need to Google. Don't Google the whole line. Get those variables out of there. You want to Google the function. Talk to them about that behavior. Uh, don't just tell people, like, read the documentation, you're going to be fine, or, like, read the documentation and get back to me. 
show them how to do it, show like actually open up the Google like the Python documentation and walk them through how to read an entry, how to find the function on the page that they're looking up. These are really important skills that are going to help them really get the best of that learning curve and take their skills to the next level. So I presented on this before a little bit. Um, so this is sort of a tiny version of a talk I gave at the Python Education Summit. Links up there. Uh, I've also recorded a screencast of giving this uh, sort of a walkthrough for actual students, presuming you've had a little bit of Python here and there. Uh, that's the link at the bottom. And this talk of uh, slides are up on Figshare with all of these happy links. And you guys are awesome. Thank you. All right, up now is Arlundo on deck open source, open science grants, and next after that is easy data logging on Raspberry Pi without wearing out Flash. Hi, everybody. I am really excited to tell you about a lot of things uh, very quickly. Um, so it, maybe I use this other programming language sometimes, um, but it doesn't have a great interface because I start to type out something and then I realize like, oh shoot, I, I wanted to change something. I start to use my arrow keys and they don't work. So I might restart this other weird programming language with RLWRAP, RL wrap, and I could say MIT scheme. And now I get to use reline shortcuts in here. Pretty neat. I can use control A and control E. All right, that's background because um, this project is called RL undo. Um, great. RL undo. Um, so I work on a project called BPython Sum. It's this fun interactive interpreter. I'm only going to show about 10 seconds of it here, but one of the things it can do is undo. <laughs> so we're gonna, we type some stuff sometimes, and you'll see that the cursor crawls back up the screen, and we've actually undone the state. So take, take seven seconds and imagine if you're trying to implement undo in the interactive interpreter, how you might do that. Um, as a hint, we do it like this, the, one of the stupidest ways you could think to do it. Re replay the whole thing, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. We replay the whole thing, except the most recent command, right? And you end up with a state, a lot like you had a moment ago. So that's cool, where does this undo fail? Well, it takes time to rebuild state. And if you're just doing a syntax check, that's fine, but if you're you know, processing data, that could be a problem. Uh, there are non-deterministic operations that could happen while you're rebuilding that state. So we don't reseed the random number generator. Um, maybe you get different inputs. Um, non edempted operations, so you could be appending to a file earlier up, undo some stuff down here, you'll keep appending bytes to that file. Um, and then, of course, um, we're not going to use a virtual machine to save the file system, and we're definitely not going to ask, that, you know, there's no API for HTTP to ask for the bytes from Google back. We can't unfire the nuclear missiles. So, so that, the, that's out of hand. We can't do anything about that. But what if we could save snapshots of state instead? We could move down on this list. One, two, and three wouldn't be a problem anymore. So uh, we're not going to do this with bPython, but we're thinking, what if we could do this? Um, there'd be higher memory requirements. What could we do about those high memory requirements of those snapshots? Um, maybe we could just save diffs, right? Save smaller amounts that have things are just different. Um, maybe we could use interesting like data structures there. Instead of you have a copy, everything points to it, or something or other. Um, but what about forking? So then we could get the operating system to take care of this for us. So on Unix systems, you have this fork system call. It looks like this or something. And um, it also, it's a general solution. It's going to work with any interact, you know, as long as, you know, so many things that won't work. But if it works, it's going to work in more than just Python. Um, so our strategy is going to, let's fork the process every time the user makes something interesting happen and then allow the user to return to those states. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, it, I, I googled LD preload and it says LD preload is super fun and easy. So I thought, great, terrific. That's, this is the actual Google result for this, which is awesome. This is Julia. Awesome blog. Um, so we're going to get into interactive interpreters and um, make them fork, basically. Um, and why limit ourselves to Python? Um, because other interactive interpreters also use RLundo, or sorry, also use Readline. Um, so you can say Python, um, RL undo Python, and A, and then say undo. Whoa, and it worked. Great, that's cool. Um, how about uh, IPython? That would be great, wouldn't it? So we've got A, A is there, undo, undo, A, great. Oh, I don't like that error being there. I can undo, cool. That's pretty neat. Um, what if we could do this in other things? So here I've got IRB, which is this weird language 
It's not as good as Python. Um, I, I could say that, undo, hey, it's not there anymore, that's great. Uh, we could do, and forget, <laughs> we could ignore that. <laughs> um, and then uh, there's this other programming language called Lua. I think it works there, right? If I can remember how to do things. Um, so A equals one, we could print A, indeed it's there, but if we undo, undo, and now we print A, it's not there anymore. Pretty cool. So the way this works, right, is this process tree thing. So this is being run with, um, 1115. Um, so as we do things, you can see this tree getting bigger, right? So we are we're forking. <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gonna get big. It's going off the side, but uh, oops. Cool. So that's that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
And what, what it takes to integrate is, is writing a download function. You just write your download function. Um, you know, make your call to GitHub. Here's a GET request. Make that call. Get the data. Yield from it. Same thing for upload. Same thing for delete. I think there's one or two more required functions, and that's all it takes to write a new backend for, for Water Butler. Okay, so if you think you can do this and you want to get funding for this, uh, let me know. If you, if you have ideas, I'm happy to hear them. If you don't have ideas but know that you could do this and want to do this to help open science, let me know. I'm happy to talk about it. I'll be here all weekend. You can email me. You can find me on Twitter. Thanks a lot. All right, up now is easy data logging, uh, then next, taming pythons with PyENV, and then our last lightning talk, scaling down for success and good feels. All right, taming pythons and then scaling. Got me? Okay. Hi, my name is Matt Behrens. I'm a software developer and consultant at Atomic Object in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We are hiring designers and developers, by the way, both Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids. Um, I want to talk to you today really quickly about a, um, the latest way I'm keeping my Python projects isolated from each other and everything else on the system. You may remember me last year I talked briefly about Brudu, which is actually my own project uh, for sandboxing homebrew kind of stuff. But that's, that's part of my, uh, my MO here. When you install things system-wide, things break everywhere all over your system. So I like to try to avoid that whenever possible. So I settled on a method of uh, using virtual M for every project, but there, I found so many problems with this. System pythons will get updated out from underneath you every time Apple ships an update. Homebrew pythons get updated out from underneath you. Virtual M's break when pythons get updated in a lot of cases. Uh, you may need access for certain projects, like today I needed access to 3.5 uh, 3 beta um, that aren't readily available. Activating and deactivating virtual M's can be tedious and error prone if you're doing it by hand. And most, of, most importantly, you can't give all this stuff to a non-Pythonista user in their MacBook. They just can't handle this kind of stuff. What we need to do is tame the pythons. Uh, this is uh, uh, Van Rossum here, my friend Danielle's uh, python, is being tamed by watching a nice little video here. I, w I went looking and I found that one of my colleagues, uh, Mitch Johnson, who's actually uh, more of a Ruby guy, found a tool called PyAmp and wrote a blog post about it, which you can see on our blog. Um, PyAmp does five things for you. It knows how to build lots of pythons, keeps track of those built pythons for you. The pythons are stable, meaning they're never going to change out from underneath you unless you specifically ask it to. Um, nothing's going to, you know, update that out from under you. It has integration with virtual lamp, and um, once that's all set up correctly, you get frictionless environment switching. You just change directory in your working directory. It pulls in the Python you want to use. It pulls in your virtual lamp. Everything's ready to go, and you can work on many of these all over your system like I do. I have about, you know, 20 projects that are unfinished at any given time. <laughs> Getting it set up on a Mac, you can do brew install. Um, there's more instructions over at the GitHub for the project if you do not have a Mac. There's a couple lines you can add to your dot .profile, which I see are missing some punctuation. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, you can get these lines at the um, GitHub as well. Um, using, uh, I've got a couple quick examples here, which I'll just kind of show you. Um, uh, install that list, double dash list, will show you all the Pythons you can build with PyM. Um, this is a really long one right here with the C flags. This is um, a tip I found because um, I have homebrew open SSL, so you need to add some flags. There's documentation for this on the PyM site. Um, but then once, once you've got the Python you want all ready to go, you change to your new product directory. You can build a virtual env right there. I called it project. And you type PyEnv local project, which in that directory tells PyEnv, say, hey, when I CD into this directory, switch to this um, this Python environment that I just created. So I created a virtual env based on 3.50 beta 3 called project. And then when, once I'm in the project directory, I'll show you how this works real quick. So uh, did the, oh, the terminal went away, of course. <laughs> oh, it's on the, is it, okay, there it is. Okay, so um, I'll just show you really quick you can install any of these using the Python build command. So that would be, you know, pyenv build in the name of a Python. Um, and I just created a uh, directory called nagbot, which is the project I'm working on. Literally, I just cd into here. There's nothing in here except my uh, uh, python.version file. But uh, those, those commands I just showed you on the slide uh, set that up for me. So, you know, I have all my, uh, all my uh, dependencies are all ready to go and everything like that. So. 
Anyway, it's mostly just a pointer to show you guys, uh, show everybody uh, about this tool. Um, check it out. I think you'll find it a lot better workflow than uh, dealing with system pythons and virtual lines. So, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, as much a talk about Python and using Python as it is a talk about how to trick yourself into doing better things. Um, so I use Python for rapid prototyping of video games. Uh, it's kind of a nice thing I like to do. I've used Kiwi, I've used Pygame, and a couple other little engines. Um, so I was working down, or I was working on a, a uh, game called Swappy. It's sort of my like new. This is my big thing right now. Uh, it's a puzzle game. It's pretty complicated for me. I'm the only one working on it uh, at the moment. And basically, I had already put about six months of work into it and was really making just no good headway, right? Just nothing was happening that I wanted to happen. It was very frustrating. Um, so basically, just halted development completely. Um, so I kind of didn't know what to do. Um, there were just too many things to work on, and I couldn't see any like big progress because I'd work on a little bit of this function here, a little bit of that function there, work on some artwork, maybe work on a level, whatever. It was kind of scrambling uh, around. So I just got into that negative feedback loop and couldn't do much about it. So what do you do when you get into a negative feedback loop? You pivot. Um, so I decided to work on a game because I was sort of bored staring at the ceiling, and I had a uh, like stress ball and I was throwing it up at the ceiling and trying to hit the ceiling but not actually hit the ceiling. Um, so I thought, what would it be like if I had a game that was that? Uh, <laughs> so this game, I don't want to do a live demo. I'm not as brave as, as, as other presenters. but uh, So all the ball does is just bounce uh, up and down and you try and hit the space bar when it's at the apex, hence the name apex. Uh, if you get close, you still get some points. Uh, if you get it like you know within a half a second or within a tenth of a second, you get 10. Uh, if you're not even close, you get zero points. So uh, it took about three hours, um, but the most important statement is the bottom one under development, which is that I finished it. It was done. It's done. This game is feature complete. There's no more things. I even had time to juice it up and add color changes and, and like sound effects and cool stuff. Um, so I finished it, and it took three hours, and that was it. I just pivoted for a single night. Um, but now I had made a game, right? I had success. I was done, right? So I was like, I'm not a complete failure. I can make games. <laughs> so driven by that, uh, I felt empowered. I felt confident, and I had gotten some experience using something. Um, so from there... I went back to Swappy, and I kind of invented, not invented, but used like Micro Agile, which was deliverables within hours. Like a sprint is uh, character control, like make sure that I can control things. It took about five hours start to finish to research, figure out, and implement. Uh, multiple characters on screen, because it has multiple characters, was two hours. You know, these were my tiny little timetables in order to give myself micro sprints, um, but I could see success. And it was kind of recalling that feeling from Apex, which was I was done with something. And it was really great, and it spurred me on to uh, finish the game. Uh, it's, I'm changing engines completely, so I'm just going to like back up on the fact that you can't grab it from GitHub yet. Um, but I finished it, and there's some artwork. It's all Creative Commons open source, so that's it. You swap around, you go through doors and cool stuff. Um, so yeah, use smaller projects to build confidence and uh, build better things. Thanks. All right, thanks all the lightning talk people. Um